Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. It's easy to fool the eye, but it's hard to fool the heart, is a quote from American actor and filmmaker Al Pacino. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our guest today, an entrepreneur, proud of his Italian heritage, who has devoted his life to bringing together Australian and Italian culture, known as the Australian Coffee King. Our guest today is Les Scarato, AM, Chief Executive Officer of Victoria Food and Beverages. Les has served as President of the Australian Coffee and Tea Association and Chairman of the YPO Gold Sydney Chapter. In 2017, Les was awarded a knighthood of the Order of Merit by decree of the French President for his work between Australia and France in the area of trade and tourism. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you can apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners and followers from all over the world, please don't forget to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform. And for our listeners in Italy, the Philippines and Brazil, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blenheim Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. In today's episode, Les shares with us his journey. Growing an international business, breaking cultural and societal barriers, changing perceptions and establishing the Australian coffee culture we all know and love today. We delve into the spirit of entrepreneurship, the dedication needed to find the odds to build a globally recognized brand with an ever-increasing portfolio. We gain an insight into Les's philosophy as he brings to the fore the importance of forging relationships, galvanized by communication, loyalty, and commitment, and the foundation of Victoria Food and Beverage's success family. So sit back and enjoy the perfect blend. Les, welcome to the show. Thank you. Really important question to start the show, Les. How many coffees have you had today? Probably about six. And what sort of coffees do you drink? I start off in the morning with a cafe latte, which is milk-based coffee, of course, first up. And then pretty much I might have another cafe latte when I get to work. And then the rest of beer, espressos. You don't start with espresso? No, no, no. You go, well, you go I, soft to start with, do you? I do. I do because it's a bit longer, but, but I tend to drink espressos to make me calmer during the day. Is that right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work? It works. It works. Okay. Les, what's the family background? Mum and dad came from, from Italy? Uh, my father came from Italy, yeah, just after the Second World War. Uh, he came out here with his mother and brother and sister. And my mother actually was born in Egypt, but of Maltese parents. Okay. And so they met out here in the 1950s when they both arrived, ended up getting married together, and that's how I came about. And where'd you grow up? Whereabouts in Sydney? First five years in Matraville, and uh, lived with my grandparents while my parents you know, were both working. And then when I turned five, uh, my mother stopped working, and um, we moved out to Cabramatta. What did the old man do for, for a crust? Initially, he had about three jobs. So he did everything from work as a milkman to work in the, you know, in an ice factory making ice on the weekends and carpets at high craft carpets. So very hard worker. And then went on to work actually for Vittoria Coffee for, um, as a salesman for a long time. What was it like as a um, young Italian growing up in the Western suburbs in those days? It was different. You know, I remember primary school was pretty 
pretty tough. Yeah, that was pretty traumatic for me. The, you know, I, I wasn't used to any type of institution and pretty much going to school at uh, five years old and, you know, being called different names. And initially I thought, geez, what the hell is this? Yeah. And they were mostly English migrants who were coming from the hostel. Is that right? Yep, at the time. And, and you know, and I was sort of made to feel as if I was the little wog boy or yep. the guy that shouldn't have been here. And yet they were the guys that had just arrived very recently. It's $10 poms. How did mum and dad deal with it all? Look, I guess in different ways. I mean, in those days, like my father's name was Rolando. My mother's name was Teresa. So he was Ron. My mother was Tessie. They anglicized, you know, all the names yeah. and, you know, and wanted to fit in very much. And that was really important. And I think the thing my parents taught me was, you know, they were grateful to Australia. We, we were very lucky that Australia took migrants in. And so they, you know, that, that was the one thing they kept saying to me about how lucky we are that Australians have been so welcoming. And that's how I ended up with this terrible name of Leslie. They wanted me to fit in. And so growing up as a kid, it was great having a name like Les. It helped a bit. I'm not so good now when I when, when you know you're very fashionable be Italian, so people call me Alessio. <laughs> I've always um, absolutely admired uh, the immigrants who've come into this country. What do they bring with them? Anything at the time? What just one or two suitcases? Yes, pretty much. That's about it. I remember my father borrowed the money from his aunt who was here. I only, you know, when you're a kid, you don't really try to find out too much about your history and your parents. But my great grandmother came before the First World War. Oh, really? Yeah, which I really didn't understand until you know, probably only recently. So she was here before the first, sorry, before the Second World War. Yep. And um, so when the Second World War ended, that's why her daughter, my grandmother, and uh, my father decided they'd come to Australia. And she died just prior to them arriving here. Now, there's some urban myths about you as a young child drinking a lot of coffee. Is that true or... It's actually true. I didn't like the taste of eggs and my father always thought I was a skinny little runt. So he'd make a little egg flip for me and put a bit of coffee in it in my bottle to, to disguise the taste. So yes, I got the taste for coffee at a very early age. Okay. Now you moved as a young man when st at school working at Cantarella Brothers. Yeah, I, I pretty much started school or sorry, working after school a week later. And in fact, I probably started between year 10 and 11 for the old fourth and fifth form. Yeah, okay. And my dad took was the salesman at the time at Candola Brothers of Victoria Coffee. Mm -hmm. And I went and worked there for a couple of months. And uh, when I went back to school, and when I finished um, year 12, a week later, my father said to me, oh, look, while you're waiting for your results, why don't you, you know, come and work with, with me at you know, Victoria, which I did. And um, I just absolutely loved it. Bought a Monaro sort of a week later and I was going to restaurants and, and I thought, this is the life, you know, who, who wants to go to school? So I just absolutely fell in love with the whole industry of going to restaurants, hotels, food it was just awesome. So there was no way I was going to university. I just wanted to stay there and work. I loved it. So what's the difference between Cantarella and Victoria? So Cantarella is really the name of the two brothers that started the business mm -hmm. and they started it just after the war. 1947, okay. and they started importing Italian food products for all the Italian migrants that were arriving here. Um, Vittoria Coffee is one of the products that they sold. So they imported a whole lot of products, but the one thing they knew you know, had to be fresh was coffee. Okay. So they started roasting coffee in 1958. So the was, company was started in 47, but in 1958, they started roasting coffee because they knew coffee had to be fresh and they were making espresso coffee for the Italians. So what were you selling at the time? When I started working there, they'd already had Victoria Coffee, but it was you know a small brand being sold to delis and restaurants um, and some cafes. And so we were very much selling more to, you know, the Italian establishments and, you know, and so it was a, you know, very much a, a much smaller business when I started. And so the Anglo-Saxons, their palate wasn't developed enough or? It was still early days, and 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 no, we, you know, if you went to the delicatessen, it was cheddar and and Devon were the, you know, the two biggest sellers. And That's right. So it, it was it was very very different in those days, but I left um, about twenty one. I turned twenty one, so I only worked there from about eighteen to twenty one, and I met my wife, who was one of the Cantarellas' daughters. So that was a very career limiting move, because going out with the boss's daughter, having my father work there and her two brothers. So I ended up leaving and going to work for Fiat 
and that was a different side of my, my history. Okay, she so had to make that big move away. Uh, what did you learn at FIT? Actually, a hell of a lot. I went in originally doing shipping and became the shipping manager, and um, I learned a whole lot about corporations, the good side of corporate life, you know, the structure, what works, training, but also I learned what I didn't want to be, and that is I learned all the things that I wouldn't want a company to be that, that's corporate. So I carried that with me when I went back to Victoria. Why'd you go back? At the time, it was to help. Um, they bought this factory and Victoria was, I mean, I remember they were packing coffee probably two or three days a week till 12 o'clock. And from 12 o'clock onwards, the guys in the factory were playing cards. And so I was sort of brought back to try to sell food to uh, Australians and take us to a different different level. Were you successful doing that? I think I did pretty well, yeah. Yeah, I, I sort of, my, my big thing was that Australians would, you know, like Italian food, so it wasn't too too forward thing, but I just knew that, you know, I remember being a kid and, and watching my friends who originally, um, I'd have to hide my lunch and was embarrassed or throw it away, to coming and stealing my sandwiches and loving eating it, you know, the food we had at home. So I thought the best way to make the company grow would be to start selling the food products in supermarkets. Okay. And at the time, we sold nothing in supermarkets. And I tried to get our coffee into the different supermarket stalls, and I'd go into stalls and do tastings. People would tell me that, you know, coffee's too strong, you know, that they don't like that sort of, you know, very strong Italian-style coffee. And first place I got the coffee into was in Coles, okay. in the fruit and veg section. You know, those big boxes where they put the oranges. And so that's where they put our coffee. And I'd be there with a little coffee machine, you know, the, a little macchinetta, you know, the little stove tops. Yes. And I'd be there trying to you know, get people to taste it. And people would be going to me, oh, Jesus, this is too strong. You know, and I thought, oh, geez, it's, it's going to be pretty hard to make this work. But yet I could see all the little old ladies who were going in, doing their shopping, and they'd stop at the cafe and have their cappuccinos with raisin toast. So I thought, you know, we've really got to push this, but add a lot more milk and push maybe the cappuccino side and, and adding milk to coffee initially, and then, you know, work up to espressos over a long period of time. And that's what we did. So I started going to all the cafes that we supplied, mm -hmm. and I just put little stickers up that was push-pull stickers on a door. Yeah. Because that's all we could I could afford at the time, right? And put Victoria Coffee and started to brand everything I had. I put Victoria Coffee on the cups, or put Victoria Coffee on the umbrellas, or our sugar, and then I got some outdoor signs, and I start putting working out a map on where people would pass, like if they're going from the airport to the city, what was the route? Yep. And I put a sign up in you know a cafe there. And it looked as if we had started to have Victoria Coffee everywhere, but in fact, you know, it was probably only about 50 to 100 stores. So that's how it, I really started to get people seeing the name. And, you know, and then when they went into the supermarket, sort of having the association about, you know, coffee and Italians. In fact, the first line I used was Victoria making Italian style coffee famous. And then when we were able to do the advertising in coffee shops, I changed it to bring home the coffee they serve in cafes. So were you doing this on your own intuition or were you getting a lot of advice? Is it experimental or what, what's going through the mind? No, pretty much just basic common sense. I didn't have a marketing degree, so I just sort of thought, well, common sense. And at the same time, I, I went into supermarkets and was trying to sell supermarkets on my own and you know, pretty much getting told that I was wasting my time and but you know, just didn't want to didn't want to give up. And everyone was telling me to change yeah. our coffee, make it lighter, change the packs because you know, it should look, have more English on it. Where I tried to make it, you know, it was, look more European. So I guess it was good, as you know, not knowing and just being pretty focused and driven and and stubborn on what you believed in. Yeah, but what, what's the takeaways from that? What did you learn from that? Because there's a bunch of entrepreneurs listening to this. So here you are trying to sell a product, but in some cases, some people are saying I don't want. Or I can't see the value of. I get that now. I mean, people always want to do what everyone else is doing. And, I, you know, I've found that if you stop and sort of helicopter up and take a look at the landscape and sort of see what everyone's doing and say, well, what's the opportunity? What? How can you differentiate yourself? How can you be different? Where most of what they do today is tell you how to be the same as everyone else. You know, you've got to do the same advertising. You've got to do, you've got to conform. 
Yeah, you know, exactly. be, be, be like the rest. Whereas everything I've done in my life was about, well, how do I stand out? I don't have a lot of money, so I can't, you know, I had to try to work out, well, how do you market yourself without spending money? You know, so how, how, do you, how do you become relevant when people are getting so many different engagements? And so, you know, I, I tried to do things like guerrilla marketing. and What's that mean? It's not fighting the enemy on their terms. It's like, you know, using different skills. So, oh, it's like you're talking like ambushing in sense of yep, guerrilla marketing. Go on. Yep. So, well, in the early days, you know, I sponsored Formula One, um, which pretty glamorous and sounds huge. But in effect, it was, you know, this team that didn't have a sponsor when it got to Australia, it had sponsors all over the world. And we came up with a deal. I think I spent 20 grand so that they could have a, a good piss up after, after the Grand Prix. And, um, and we got two Formula One cars with Vittoria coffee on it. And then in Adelaide, I went around and had little sun visors and handed them out and had girls on every corner, which today is called ambush marketing and is illegal. But in those days, you know, it was acceptable. And uh, everyone sort of went in with these little sun shows with Vittoria coffee on them. And I was able to take customers and people in. We had spot in the pits and went on to sponsor Formula One for about eight years. So that was amazing. And uh, we did April Fool's pranks. So everyone does them now. Yeah. But when I did them in the early 80s, I, I said that I discovered the white coffee bean. <laughs> and that you didn't have to buy you know, or add milk. That you, All you had to do was use this white coffee bean and you had you know, your white milk. And so I took out a, an, an ad saying that we discovered the, the white coffee bean. But I made sure that I let you know, all the journalists and opinion makers at the time, like John Laws and Alan Jones and Mike Carlton. Yep. I let them know the truth. And when people would ring in, they'd be told that it was a, a joke. Thank you for participating. Leave your name, we'll send you out a packet of coffee. Did you always know you had, or always knew you had the uh, the creative streak inside? No. No, I didn't. It, it was fantastic to get the opportunity to discover that and to be able to to use that, but no, I, I I wasn't creative at school, or no, I didn't think I had any creativity in me at all. Um, in fact, when I first started working, I was more in the shipping area. Yeah, okay. And so, to look at how I could start selling the product, sort of made had to make me become creative and look at how I could start to get people to to buy our products. So, are you putting yourself in the shoes of others, or are you taking notes on people all day long as you're doing your ambush studying? I think getting close to your customers was was what was you know the best thing for me. If you're in the supermarkets, yes, and you're doing coffee tastings, yeah, you're talking to all the people that are buying coffee, and you're asking them and you're hearing what they tell you. If you're going to see the cafes and you're talking to them, and I think today the whole mistake is that marketing and sales seem to be separated, and a lot of marketing people don't even go anywhere near customers. Where to me, it's intrinsically linked, and you know, marketing and sales are one. And that, you know, marketing cre helps create the environment to help sell. And I just learned so much. And then I could adapt that to what I did in my marketing or the advertising or, you know, understanding that it was complex for people to make coffee. So they had those, you know, filter paper things. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And so I started doing promotions with plungers because that was easy. You put the coffee in and, you know, I tried to simplify the whole process. And instant coffee was huge at the time. Yeah. And so the simpler you made the thing of making coffee and the easier and took out the mystique and the whole complication that, that today, you know, you've got all these people, that, you know, the hipsters and the, yes. you know, the people that look like pirates. And it seems to be that, you know, if you don't look like a pirate and you don't have tattoos and ear piercing, you can't make coffee. And they tend to make it incredibly more complicated than what it needs to be. You know, coffee's complex but the basics are pretty simple and helping people make it simpler for them so they can get a better product at the end is what, what's important well i might ask you a question on that then how important is the barista he's incredibly important at the end of the day you know you can do all the things right with coffee get fresh coffee have the highest quality but if he doesn't have the machine that's cleaned if he doesn't know how to grind it the right way to extract it in the right time and get that beautiful crema he'll ruin your coffee. And you'll have people that will say, oh, my coffee was bitter. But, you know, that could be because the machine hasn't been cleaned or, they've, you know, they've over-extracted. So the barista is incredibly important and getting all those elements 
together uh, make a good cup of coffee. But at home, you want it to be simpler, right? And so that, that's the challenge. And one of the greatest things that's happened, I think, is that, you know, capsules have really taken people away from instant coffee. And the market's doubled in retail at the moment. So what is the market? Give us a rundown. About $404 million now in retail. Of course, out of home is billions. But in supermarkets, it's about $402 million now. And the great news is that over half of it, and just recently in dollars, capsules has, be has become bigger in dollars than normal coffee. And it's taken that from instant coffee and brought in a lot of new users because it's simple, clean, and people like it. And whilst I prefer, you know, drink coffee from espresso machine, yeah. I see it as a journey. Okay. So moving people away from instant, getting into capsules, then they'll move on and start making better coffee and they'll start with their cafe latte and cappuccinos and eventually, you know, they'll, they'll become, you know, espresso drinkers and, and continue the, the whole journey of coffee. Jumping around a little bit here, COVID... Has that been an explosion in capsules as a result? Yep. They had about a 60% growth rate during COVID. Wow. And so capsules certainly benefited from, from COVID, yeah. Now, you've got a reputation for being a bit of a workaholic and a control freak. Is that pretty fair? Yep. <laughs> in equal <laughs> orders. <laughs> okay. And um, when people used to say I was a control freak, I used to feel so embarrassed and took it as a you know real insult and today i wear it with a badge of honor mm. because if a control freak means that you run your business and you've got your hands on the key spinning plates and that means that you know you know that, that stick with the plates on it and the guy runs along and yep. keeps spinning all the plates and as the thing's wobbling and just about to fall he runs over and spins the next plate so if being a control freak means that you're, you're touching all the key points in your business when they need that little bit of extra, then I, I don't see it as a as a negative anymore. It's all about pride, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you can't be a control freak that doesn't grow people if you go from 2 million to 300 million like we have, right? So I think helping people grow, giving people the space, but making sure that people understand what our values are, what our culture is, you know, what the purpose but why are we here? You know, what do, why do we do what we do? And getting everyone on board is important to me. And you can't do that by, by having, you know, a whole lot of different people going off in different directions. But it hasn't been an easy road, has it? No, it hasn't. No, it's, it's had its challenges and there's no, there's no doubt about that. But I guess most things worthwhile, you know, sort of have their ups and downs. But Yeah, but look, in the 80s, from what I understand, some tough times. Financially, pretty difficult from what I can understand. Yep, yep. The company um, in the 80s pretty, pretty much came close to being broken, trading insolvent. And that time, interest rates were like 22% overdraft. Yeah, that's right. And that's pretty much when I took over as the head of the company. And okay. I had a lot of people depending on me. What role were you in before that? Sales and marketing. So you're still sales and marketing? Still sales and marketing, yeah. And you're number one salesperson of all the ideas? Yep. Okay. And we... selling to supermarkets and running the reps. So why is the company going? Pretty much debt. The debt from the 80s was, was the big thing. And, um, you know, so we had to sort of look at what was going to be the future. And I agreed to buy out family members at the time. Okay. Take on, you know, the leadership role. And the truth was I didn't know what I was doing. I, I didn't have a clue. I, I'd been a salesman and a marketing guy. But yet I had, I had everyone from, you know, my father to all the people that I'd grown up with sort of looking at you to be successful. And the truth was, I didn't know what I was doing. And um, I, I know it's not fashionable to talk about having military strategies and it's not cool now to say anything to do in business about anything to do with, with strategies, but that's all I knew. So I studied, you know, I studied what the army did and how they operated. And I, I tried to replicate that. I took young kids, trained them, dressed them, in, you know, they were all dressed in suits got them to understand what our culture was, what the arguments were, how to sell, how to sell the benefits. Presentation being everything. Yep. And grow people and um, and understand that, you know, we needed the discipline at the time. And I sat in the boardroom with my senior managers for about 
six or seven years, I think, maybe even longer, I had to make sure that every bill that came in, that we had enough money to pay for it. And I had everything from purchasing to, you know, the checks going out to money coming in. And I had a baptism of fire on how to run a business and that profit doesn't mean anything and why cash is king. king. Yeah. And I learned all of that going through that process. And, you know, going back to your question about being a control freak, you know, it, it's interesting that you, you go through those periods. And so you have, it's like a plane crashing to the ground. When the plane's crashing to the ground, you don't actually care what champagne they're serving in in the back seat, right? You want to you pull this thing out of a nosedive. You're listening to everyone. Everyone's telling you what you should be doing and you're taking it all in, but you, you're really focused. And I've never been as focused in my life as when we were crashing to the ground and going broke and everyone's life and future was dependent on what I did. So... That focus was, was, was incredible. Was there much room for self-doubt? Yeah, there was a lot of self-doubt. But so most how, do you, so how, do you, how do you work that through? You have to be able to speak to everyone, listen, take everything in, but then you've got to have the self-conviction in picking the right direction. Mm. And if you're wrong, being able to change that quickly and not being too proud to say, well, I made a mistake, let's change. And being very fast on your feet. So some of the stuff you learned from studying military would have been about information flow, I suspect. Correct. So you're quick on your feet, as you say, based on the information you're getting or in intelligence that you're gathering from your customers, etc. Yep. And 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 the closer you are to your customers, the more you cut that time lag between what's happened with the customer and management, the better. And you know, even today we've got a war room, and. People say, oh, you shouldn't call it the war room. Yeah, we can call it the customer center. You can call it whatever you want. But in reality, I copied it from watching people in a war room yeah. who cared about their troops and who wanted to be in contact with their troops. You know, today a soldier has a microphone and he's, you know, he's connected back and he's, you know, they've got a camera on him and he can, they can see what's happening with him. And to me, you know, the salespeople out in the field now, they're connected to us. Yeah, why don't you talk us through that? This is pretty special, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. It, it means that, uh, you know, a, a salesman can be, you know, we know where the salesman is. He's got a buddy back at, in the war room. He can go into an account. He can talk to the customer. He can place an order. It comes to us instantaneously. If he wants something, you know, it can be sent in and there's an answer immediately on, I want, I need a service on my coffee machine. Okay. He can get the thing up while he's there and tell the person when a service tech's going to be there. He can, he can give him an answer immediately from, from the help from the war room, but he's also got everything on his iPad. So he knows. He can show the customer all the previous orders. He can show the customer whether he's up and down. He can help the customer understand what areas of his business are working, what's not working or what's gone down, and do little mini reviews with them and help the customer make more money. And if you help the customer make more money, you'll end up making more money for us. So speaking of which, so during those dark days, as you said, you've, you're acquiring the business. If I'm a customer or I'm a potential client, I'm worried about your solvency, aren't I? And I'm worried about, do I stick with you or not? How did you keep me engaged, Les? How did you reassure me? Look, in the end, it was about relationships. And the one thing that I've been blessed with is our people. And everything we do is about relationships. And today, so many people talk about, no, businesses, you know, relationships are getting less and less important. Well, it doesn't work for me. And so the relationship that the salesman had with the customers, and we don't tend to leave it the relationship with one person. Okay. So it might be the salesman, it might be the supervisor, it might be the service tech that goes in, you know, it might be the calls that they're making from our customer service area. But there's a connection with customers on many levels, not just one. But everything we do is about relationships. So when you started turning the business around, did you have a plan in mind? Like you said, you were new to this big gig as the chief. Did you have a vision? Yeah, and initially I thought that I really wanted to have a whole group of products that we owned because okay. we started as an importer. So we started importing you know, mineral waters from Italy, a whole range of products, but they were owned by other people. We'd build up a mineral water, and then it'd be bought out by, you know, big 
company in Europe and all of a sudden they go, thank you, but now we'll take it over. Yeah, right. and, and we've done a lot of things. Like we started Nutella in Australia. We started San Pellegrino Mineral Water. I think we were importing San Pellegrino Mineral Water in, in the 50s. Is that well. right? Yep. And we built up lots of other brands and we were the distributor in Australia for Nanda Pasta, which at the time became, was the market leader. Yep. Then they sold to Nestle. And then I went out and got a pasta called Barilla and I bought that in from Italy and we built that up. And then they said, thank you and opened up their own office. And, you know, I'm a bit dumb, but I started to work out that there's no future in building other people's brands. And so we started to look at focusing on building our own brand. So, of course, I started with Vittoria. Then we bought in and own our own mineral water, Santa Vittoria. So it's quite interesting. We now own a, an Italian mineral water that sold in 22 countries around the world, but the money comes to Australia, you know, and the water goes directly from Italy to, you know, from everywhere, from the States to Malaysia to Singapore. And um, people find that a bit funny when they talk about this Italian mineral water, yeah. but it's actually owned by us here in Australia. I came out now with a, a hazelnut spread called Natino. Yeah, so, so my future is about building our own brands and then doing what we do in Australia around the world. So that was really my vision where you could walk into a cafe and have everything you get in that cafe that, that we can supply. So when we sell overseas, mm -hmm. we can sell someone coffee, water, we can sell them gelato and teach them how to make Italian gelato. We've got the equipment, we've got the gelato equipment. It's a one-stop shop. And to me, that's our competitive advantage of being different. When did you recognize, hold it, I can do this? I've got success coming my way. What was the uh, the first sign for you? That's a tough question. I, I don't really know. You probably don't. I think hitting number one, being the number one coffee, when I, when I hit number one as the number one selling pack was probably the first time I sort of thought, wow, because I wrote a story in, in the 80s in a trade publication saying I wanted to be the biggest coffee company in Australia. And I got a whole lot of people making fun of me and laughing at me and sending me notes and telling me I was an arrogant little wog, <laughs> which is true. And I, I, I've actually got that on my wall. Yeah, you might. Yeah, yeah, go go, going into the office, I've got the article that was in Retail World in the 80s saying what I, that I wanted to be number one. And then in a little box next to them, I've got the front cover of Retail World when we hit number one as the number one selling pack then when I hit number one as a coffee company and I have that, you know, as every day when I walk into my office, I walk past that. So that, that's probably the first time I thought, yep, we can do it. And today I think you can do it overseas as well. I, I think you, sometimes you, you have a little bit of an inferiority complex and think, oh no, we're not, we're not as good, uh, you know, as the, as the people overseas. But I think our future was going to be how well we do overseas. So what does that look like? Well, unfortunately, we, we had a we opened up a branch in the states, and um, COVID is really in California, knocked that for a six, and so we've had to scale down over COVID. But we supply today a whole lot of countries coffee, water, a range of products, but it's mainly in that food service area. Yeah, okay. I think there's an opportunity to make Victoria much more of an international brand, and hopefully when you know, travel resumes and, you know, we start flying again. I think opening up Victoria stores. Yes. Um, Are you going to do that, eh? Eventually, that's the future, I think, for us to have, you know, especially in some of the airport hubs and yeah. getting Victoria seen where you can go in and, and, and actually have a full-blown Italian coffee concept. Now, speaking full-blown Italian and international, you um, pulled off a pretty big coup a number of years ago getting most... One of the most famous actors of all time. I wish I could claim the glory for that, but that was actually my son. So and what's the story there? So he was about 24 at the time. He came to me and said, Dad, if you could have one actor do our ads, who would it be? And I sort of thought about it and I thought, oh, look, either Johnny Depp or Al Pacino because they've never done an ad. And he said, well, if you could choose one, which one? I said, well, you know, the Italian aspect, I think Al Pacino would be the, be the one. He said, Dad, how much would you pay? And so I rattled off a few numbers and he said, I got him cheaper sign here and put a thing in front of me. And so I said, okay, I'll sign on the proviso that you stick to what our 
what we do, and that is you don't use an ad agency. You can use the best production house or the best director, but we do it. We come up with a concept and you have an ad that you're proud of and it's going to last at least five years. And he wanted to go off and use you know, this big ad agency and I said, no. So he went, came back and he got Barry Levinson to be the director, you know, the guy that did Rain Man and a whole lot of, you know, Good Morning Vietnam as our director and then Wrigley Scott Productions. And he came up with a campaign, Pacino, and gave, we gave Pacino a lot of leeway to, you know, to shoot four commercials in New York. And we did that and spent a couple of days there with him. And um, it was amazing. We, we had so, so, it put us on the map all around the world. In fact, it's cost me a small fortune having to fight all the people that were then trying to register Victoria Coffee all over the world. Is that right? Yeah. And it's been great because it's lasted People remember it, got cut through, and so, yeah, it's been really successful. But that, but that was my son. You still know why he said yes? Like you said, he'd never done it before for anybody else. I asked him that when I had lunch with him, and he said to me that given he was close to 70 at the time and all the things he'd done, by the way, we paid him more than he earned in Godfather too. So he, he didn't really earn a hell of a lot of money in those early days. Oh, yeah, right. And, you know, and he told me the story about the fact that, you know, they were going to fire him when he was doing Godfather 1 because they didn't think he was tough enough and that he was trying to play, you know, the laid-back person so that when he became the Godfather, there was more impact. But Francis Ford Coppola took him to lunch and said, look, you know, the guys are talking about getting rid of you. And then they f shot that scene where he shoots the the police sergeant, I think, in the restaurant. He did. And that turned the thing around. Otherwise, he was going to be lose the, the role. That's right, because then he had to go off to Sicily, didn't he? Spend some time there. Yep. Family. It's very important for you, isn't it? Yep. And you talk about your son who pulled that deal off. So can you talk to me about the dynamics of running a family business? It's probably one of the most rewarding things that you can ever imagine, but also probably the most challenging <laughs> thing. So it's... You've all got families and you've all got kids and on the positive side, it structures our whole mission, which is, you know, we, we operate on family values. So everything we do is based on family values about trust and respect for people, treating everyone as part of your family that you bring into the business and be careful about who you bring in from the way you recruit to the way you train. So everything you do is about treating them people different and, and being different. To, to others and that creates a whole lot of issues because it, it takes time for people to understand that but you know having people who work for you who you know you have christmas parties you know their kids you watch them grow up you know the kids go into supermarkets and they fix up the shelves it's so much more than just you know just a job you know i mean you can get a job anywhere but it becomes a whole culture of to me transcends we do a lot more than just sell coffee because it, it gives us a purpose for everything we do. You know, and to me, it's about you know, lending a helping hand, not only to the people that work with you, but then using that to lend a helping hand, you know, to, be it to community or to charities and, and give back. But family also has role in congruity. I sometimes end up being the old man with my son, which is really unfair for him. And when, it, when he needs to be, sometimes he'll play the, you know, the dad card. And so that makes it a bit harder. But the ability to keep communicating and talking, I think, is paramount in, in any family. Um, and then you've got all the dynamics, you know, the old lion. And then you have a young lion that comes in that thinks the only way he can take over the pride is if he kills the old lion. That's right. So because everyone's trying to prove themselves. And what he and I are doing is, is trying to work on how a father and son can work and break the mold of always being, you know, a competition. How do you take people's skills? Because he does things a million times better than me. And, and he's pushing at 100 miles an hour, and it's fantastic. You know, he's just launched probably 100 new SKUs. We're, we've just launched into instant coffee. He's, we've launched two boutique coffee brands. We've launched a tea brand. Really? Yep. Just with Coles. We've launched coffee bags. So, you know, he's going at 120 miles an hour. And at the same time, 
you know, I'm the old bull trying to say, yep, but we also need to make sure we've got plans in place and so it doesn't fail. And when we get those dynamics working together as a team and all the SM or my senior managers are together, it's a strong dynamic. So it can be incredibly rewarding and, and very successful. But it comes with challenges, of course, like any family. What does the brand mean to you? It's sort of like, in a, in a way, encapsulates my whole life because it's f my 40-year journey of looking at that brand and everything floods in from saying that's a brand that's only a continental brand. It'll be sold in the continental section. It'll never be a market leader. Australians will never drink strong coffee or, oh, I've been through everything from, oh, yeah, but now it's too popular. So we won't have it in restaurants. And then, you know, getting it in the best restaurants and hotels became a challenge. And people telling me always we're either not successful or we're too successful and using everything as a, a roadblock. So it, 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 I guess when I look at the name, it reinforces that someone will always tell you why you can't do something. And I get annoyed because it's people will say, I know you're too big now. You're too popular. You know, I remember it used to say, well, it used to be because we weren't really Italian, we were Australian, where people wanted Italian coffee. And now it's because we're too popular or it just reinforces to me what you can do and how much bigger you become as a person. I mean, I've grown so much. I've had some of the most amazing experiences in my life that I'm very grateful for. I've met so many people. I've also been able to help a lot of people as well and I've been and I've been helped by a lot of people a lot of mentors I've just met people in life who you know kid from Cabramatta king of Spain or I've met you know presidents or you've met prime ministers you know been with you know the homeless and and seen what people on the ground can do and the hard work charities are doing for for homeless people for kids the hospitals you know you only have to go to the Sydney Children's Hospital and spend some time there. Yeah. So it, it, it's an amazing journey and trying to get that broader feeling for your staff mm. where they're a part of all of that means that it, it you know we're, we're more than just selling coffee. Do you turn off at all? Not a lot, no. No, not a lot, no. You go through things and you learn about meditation and you do yoga and do exercise, but you, you get criticized in life because of the way you are, right? Yep. But when the shit hits the fan, they want all those characteristics that they complain that you've got. So in the 80s, yep, I was everything they said. I had to develop a lot of those skills to save the company, yep. to save people and be successful. Then soon as things go well and you get the plane out of the nosedive, they're talking about, well, you know, let's talk about the champagne again. And, you know, you're too controlling. Just, you know, chill out. Let's see if the plane can do a couple of spins. And I go, no, no, no. This is a big plane. You know, you, you can't do spins. We're better just being at 33,000 feet with lots of fuel just in case something happens and we can ride through things. And then COVID hits. And then all of a sudden they say, well, God, we're glad that we've got a bit of extra fuel and then they want you to have all those characteristics again of you know no one argues who the boss is when COVID hit and it was like what do we do but are you flying the plane through COVID or are you navigating with your son navigating really with all of them it's okay. because the business is much more than me and my son we've got some amazing people and when COVID hit we all came together and we listened to everyone we worked out all the options but we had to move quickly and in the end, like there had to be one person that makes the final call. Yeah. And I had to make the call, but then each and every one of them would go out and in their own way, the individual leaders, and they used all their leadership skills to motivate their people to do what had to be done and go beyond anything that I expected to do. So there were a lot, a lot of key learnings in COVID. It was one of the most difficult things I've had to do since the 80s because, you know, initially we had to make people redundant, which I've never done in my life. Oh, really? And that was incredibly gut-wrenching. Yeah. When you know people, when you know their families, that becomes incredibly personal. 
the good news is that, you know, JobKeeper initially worked, but we never saw or never thought that retail would explode the way it did. I, you know, I didn't foresee the panic buying. And when all that happened, it meant that our supermarket business was able to make up for the losses that we had. You know, when COVID hit in March, we had 5,000 cafes, restaurants, hotels, airlines, because we supply all the Qantas lounges around the world, Qantas Airlines, casinos, large institutions, all stop. All stop buying. A lot of people couldn't afford to pay us. So we had huge issues again in how are we going to pay cash flow. We had stock arriving from overseas for six weeks with another six weeks being shipped. We had you know, coffee that we'd produced that you know restaurants and cafes had closed up so we weren't able to get rid of the and sell that coffee and you know coffee deteriorates as you know mm. so we were confronted with all those issues and the strange thing is i always believe that the thing that gave us strength was all our different customers you know the fact that we supplied so many areas but i never thought that it would be the food service area that has so many clients never dreamt that there would be something that would make them stop buying from us. I could understand that maybe a major supermarket might stop, yep. but I never believed that in one hit you could knock out so many areas. And so it was the supermarkets and the independent grocers that kept us alive. And we were able to bring back, you know, most of the people shortly after that. But when you went through that tough period, what sort of percentage of business are we talking about where you were, my God, we're losing here? Initially, it would have been 50% of our business. Yeah, wow. And so, yeah, it was huge. How do you reckon you performed then under pressure, looking from that helicopter perspective now? Internally, not good the first couple of months, but externally, yeah, the appearance was that I knew what I was doing and handing out the life vests. But the incredible thing was all the staff that supported and and they would say to you, we know you'll get us through this. We know we'll be all right. And being able to communicate very quickly to staff that yes, things are okay. You know, the supermarket business is growing. You know, JobKeeper has meant, you know, being able to keep certain people working. And it really brought together the, the company. And yeah, and so all in all, all the management learned so much. You, you can, especially for, for young, young people, you know, young people who think, you know, the world's always going to be this way. Yeah, right. Nothing's going to ever go wrong. I think this was a, a great learning opportunity for everyone. You pick up market share? Yeah, we did in the end, yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Uh, initially, it was pretty tough, but then mm. after that, we did pick up market share. What's the story behind Qantas then? How did that come about? Oh, we, we started dealing with Qantas a long, long time ago. And I often say that nothing has given me a bigger buzz in life. And you asked before about when when did you feel as if, wow, this is pretty big, yeah. is, you know, you get on a plane and you're in the Qantas lounge and they make you a Victoria coffee and then you get on the plane and it was, you know, it was in first class and they bring you a Victoria coffee and then, you know, you can get off in, you know, Singapore and walk around and you go to a restaurant and see a Victoria coffee and we flew to LA just before COVID and same thing, you know, to, to land in, LA and go to a restaurant, go to a hotel and they're serving you Victoria coffee and then come back into the LA lounge at Qantas and be served a Victoria coffee and think, wow, sort of really blew my mind. What do you reckon sets you apart from your competitors, Liz? Probably my age. <laughs> um, longevity. I mean, people these days, I think, undervalue, you know, corporate history. And I think so, do you? Yeah, I mean, I, I often say now I get in a lot of trouble because I'm sort of got to justify why they still need me and that put me into the coffee home, <laughs> and, I, and I sort of, and I sort of say, listen, guys, you know, our competitors have got all the big McKinsey groups and yes. research people, and they've yeah. got some of the best executives in the world, and yet we've been able to be market leader for thirty years, right? And that's because we've got knowledge of the market, some history, good brand, and a good team. 
And I just think a good team always beats, you know, an individual star player every time. All right, you've got to select that team. How do you go about selecting that team? And talk about that, that regime that you set them up for. It's the characteristics of the person that I look for. I mean, you can teach people skills, but you can't put into people what God left out. And too many times I see people trying to put in to people what God's left out. It just doesn't work. And so if someone wants, shares our family values, if someone really wants to grow and they're genuine, you can teach them and, and work with them and, and it makes you know life worthwhile. We're, you're at work a lot more than you are at home. Mm -hmm. So surrounding yourself with people who you want to be with, who, who can work hard, but yet you can joke and be silly and, and feel that you've got their back, you know, and we, my senior management team, the newest is been there six years, my HR manager, but everyone else is 15 years, 18 years, 20 years. And we go through a journey together. We, you know, we know about what's happening in our lives, what's happening with their kids, what's upsetting them. And, you know, we're so close that we can get together and, and sort of talk about an issue. Now that's very daunting and confronting for a lot of people and just wouldn't happen in a corporate environment. That's right. For some people, it doesn't happen. It's a, it's a natural thing. You can't force that. But we build relationships. And if you care about someone, you care about the whole person, not, not just the eight hours that they're at work. And if you get that right, it's incredibly powerful. But people give a lot of rhetoric these days. Mm -hmm. And I, I see, you know, they talk about leadership and they talk about these things, but in reality, they don't want to put in what's really required to be a leader. Everyone wants to be a manager, and but then they don't want to work. They don't want to put in the time of knowing a person. You know, they don't invite people to their home. They don't know their kids. They don't know their what's going on in their life. And then they expect them to have this really strong bond. And I, you know, I laugh when everyone talks to me about, oh, we need to do team building. We need to make sure we do this in a conference. But yet, you know, they want to work from home and be away from their people rather than being with their people, you know. And there are certain roles that you can work from home and life balance is important. And that that is important, right? But it's pretty hard if you're a, a, a leader, right, to be saying those things and then not want to know the individual and to really get to know the person. And and that takes time. And, and it takes you being vulnerable and to build that empathy and, and trust. It's like a you know a friendship or a family. You, you, you only get out of it what you put in. It's interesting. You said a few things there, which is contrary to, as you say, corporate thinking. One is tenure. So everyone's telling us to refresh, bring in new people, and you'll get better outcomes. You've had people, what, 5, 10, 15, 20 years plus at your organization. So how do you keep staying ahead of the pack? When I was 16, the first day I went to work part-time at Vittoria, the truck driver that took me around and I went out with him, and then he stopped at lunchtime, or not lunchtime, after he finished at about 2 o'clock, and he stopped and said, now you can have a cigarette, Les, I'm going to have a sleep. He still works in the business today. Is that right? Yep. I think it was a bit of a shock when that pimply little kid became his boss one day. He still works. And, you know, I've been trying to get him to retire or to take it easy. And he just keeps saying, now, please don't do that to me. And he knows every customer by first name. And he's just so engaged and they love him. So, yeah, so he's still, he's still in the business. So he's, is he still years. sleeping? Is he still sleeping? No, I think he knows I've caught not to what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the DNA, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I think you've got to understand what makes you different, what makes you unique. And our people are what makes us unique. Being able to walk around, speak to people, see how they are, and understanding everyone that's in the business from, you know, the guy packing coffee. The guy that originally was packing our coffee packs in a box. I found out that he was, you know, had a university degree, he was from Pakistan, and he ended up running our whole coffee factory, taking people beyond what they ever thought that they could do in life. I mean, I grew up in Cabramatta, 
And I've been really fortunate to be blessed to, you know, with the success that I've had. But it's it's a shallow success if you don't take others on the journey with you. And I feel incredibly proud of some of the people and what they've done and what they've achieved. And I at least can say I've, I've been a little bit of part of that journey with them and their success. What's the uh, what's the two day business trip that you're going to take me on if I was lucky enough ever to work for you, Les, or work with you? Two day business trip for the new starters. I take away every new starter. COVID put a bit of a hole in that, but when we've just only restarted started that about a month ago. But everyone that starts in the company, I take the first group away in the first six months, and then the second group, and I spend two days with them, and we talk about our history, our culture, our values, where we came from, where we're going, why we are the way that we are, so there's an understanding. We explain and the vulnerabilities of you know, who we are and what's happened to us, so they get an appreciation of why sometimes this lunatic is the way he is. And then we get to hear their story. And so I'd want to know as much about you. I mean, we, could talk, we talk about our customers, we tell stories. I bring other managers at the same time and they tell their stories. And it's really interesting. On the second day, we do lifelines. What does that mean? People start to talk about their life and they talk about their journey. And okay. we just do a little lifeline on a board and they talk about where they grew up and sort of like a high and low. And they'll say, well, I was born here and at, no, that was a high, but it's six went to school, that was a low, or this, I got married, was a high, I got divorced, which was a low. And, they, and it just is a bit of a guide. And they divulge what they want to, yeah. but it just gives a snapshot for everyone on that person. And there have just been so many people who, it sounds a bit cathartic, but there have been so many people who've, uh, who've said, I've never told anyone this, but, and they've then told a secret in their life that they haven't shared and they've used this time to do it and you know and then we've given them help you know in areas because they felt safe enough and comfortable enough to say this in a company with a CEO and people and I've often asked you know what what made you feel safe you yeah. know and to, to be able to say that and they say well no one's ever asked me and shared what what you've shared and no one's ever asked me the questions that you've asked and so yeah so i get so much out of a new starters conference it's just not about me teaching and them getting information we get so much and we get to learn what that person is what makes him tick yeah and, and so by by that six month period you already know so much about that person vulnerabilities you talk us through as an entrepreneur you've messed up you've made the wrong call and how did you salvage the situation how long have we got <laughs> is that true isn't it yeah i think i probably got eight out of ten right and i've made heaps of mistakes right but i think the ability if you're in a shared environment where people are on your side and you know they've got your back you can make a mistake, but you change quickly and take another course. And yeah, I've, I've made some doozies. I mean, the one everyone refers and laughs at me all the time is, I, I thought it'd be a great idea. You know those Listerine mouth strips? Well, I thought it'd be a great idea to have a coffee-flavoured one. And so instead of having Listerine and that terrible taste in your mouth, yeah. you'd pull out this thing and you have a coffee-flavoured mouth strip. Yeah, well, that didn't work. <laughs> so we, you know, it was only 40 grand, but... I've still got one in my desk to remind me and most of my management team do as well. And whenever I, you know, have a go at them about something, they just lift up the mouth strip and remind me of that, you know, we all make mistakes. What's an entrepreneur to you then? I guess someone who can see and have a vision and motivate a whole lot of others to share that vision. And, you know, we were talking about you know, being in war before and yeah. leaders who can motivate people to, you know, jump over a, a wall and face a barrage of bullets. Well, I'm just asking them to go and source some coffee. So, 
It's nowhere near as dramatic as that. But you've got to win people's heads, but you've got to win their hearts. And if you don't do that, you're not an entrepreneur. And so, yeah, you, you can have all the vision in the world, but if you don't know how to share that, motivate the people to actually believe in the cause and to be there with them, and there shouldn't be anything that, you know, you ask them to do or they do that you can't do yourself. You really believe that motto? Yep. Yeah, that they can do better than you. But yeah, I, I still, you know, like I, I talked to you before about our system yeah. that we developed and on my phone, I can go to any client and, and stop it outside the front of a, a cafe or a restaurant. And I can look up the phone and I know who the owner is. I know how much he's bought. And when I walk in and start talking to them, I know what they've bought. I know what they've done and they're important to me and they feel that we care about them, that they feel valued, that we're not this big company that treats them as, you know, customer 3,442 out of 5,000. And if I go in a supermarket, I still fix the supermarket shelves. Not because the extra $60 or whatever in pulling stock's gonna make a difference, but the day I stop doing that is the day I don't wanna be involved in business. It's part of who we are, it's the DNA and the love for what you do. Strategy is pretty important in war. New weapons are pretty important in war. So where do you take the time to think about your strategy and the weapons or new innovations you're going to bring in or new products in your case? Actually, the, we spend a lot of time on strategy. We've, we call it the grand plan, which is this you know, huge Bible. I mean, my son laughs at me all the time because I commit it to paper. And the reason I do that is because Every, we get we collect everything from everyone from you know where do we want to be in 12 months where do we want to be in 24 months you know what are the steps to get there we do a SWOT analysis on all the issues and look at the opportunities and which are the low-hanging fruit we should do first what's the cost of doing the others you know we put in the organizational charts budgets the whole lot but because I'm getting information from everyone they're in different formats so I do commit it to paper so I've got this big A4 thing with all the plan that, but then of course, you know, it, it gets digitized and, you know, gets put on my iPad. But so the strategy is incredibly important. And I, I think if I've always done that, I've always spent the time writing the strategy, writing the plan with, you know, real clear steps. And, you know, I, I sometimes give a speech about businesses like flying a plane. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to be sitting in Melbourne in the plane and it's raining and be able to describe to people that you're flying to Hawaii and articulate what success is going to look like when you get there. It's going to be sunny, doing the hula and the beautiful sunshine and paint a vision of what success looks like. But you need to plot your journey. So you need to be continually making sure that at each point, you know, yep, we are flying over Fiji. Yep, we are on track. And, and that's what we do in our strategy, that we make sure that we know where we want to get to, but we have clear guidelines as to where we have to be and when. But that all cascades down. So I have a, a grand plan and a business plan. That then drops down to every department. Every department then has a 12-month plan, and every employee has 12 months objectives. And on my phone and on their phone and their manager's phones, their objectives drop down monthly. So that you can talk to an employee and say, how are you going? And you know what his objectives are and what he's achieved. And they can only write down what they've achieved if it's finished. It's no process. And that's a great way to force managers to make sure that they're continually talking to their staff monthly about, are they on track? Is this the right objective that we should be following? But also gives the opportunity for feedback. So the employee can say, Here's what's working, here's what's not working, here's the extra training I need, and opens that dialogue. Because I can't, sad to say, but I can't let that up to, to chance to tell everyone that they've got to talk to their employees and make sure it's structured in a way that the message is delivered. It's too important. Yes, yeah, representing you at all times, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And not reviews once a year, not reviews once every six months, it's monthly reviews. And when the employees, they love it because it gives them the opportunity to, to also cover off the aspects of what they're achieving and what they see 
isn't working, so it can fly back up and we can change what we're doing. What can corporate Australia or the big corporates learn from the entrepreneurs? Well, they can learn a lot, I think, but it'd be good if they, we don't teach them. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, I can't outmuscle you know, some of these the biggest companies. So we need to be different. And, you know, I think one of the things they're doing well is they're starting to break it up into smaller teams. And, you know, they, they've learned that. They've learned a lot. It's, it's the rhetoric as opposed to the actual doing, you know. And people might say to me now, oh, well, you know, everyone's working from home, so we need to work from home. They go, well, no, if everyone's doing that, that isn't the key thing we should just be looking at. We should be trying to work out what is it that our staff think makes us unique and build on that that no one else can say. So all right, are you really talking bottom up? So you, you do listen to your staff? You have to. I mean, at the end of the day, what's the use of, I mean, pe people will read what corporates are doing, right? And, but by then it's too late. Mm. To me, the, the basic things are just a given, you know, whether that's flexibility or whatever, they're just given. What you want is what makes you different, what makes you unique, what can they say about us that they couldn't say at the biggest corporate competitors. And the fact of you know being able to talk to the owners, the fact of having a voice, the issues, the, the family aspect, all the things you spoke about before, yeah. it's what makes you unique, not what makes you the same. How are you going with that new, that young generation, Les? Are they coming back to work or what are you going to do there? Now, all in all, not bad. I, I, I certainly have some heated debates sometimes with my son yeah. in relation to, and I think that the truth is that there's a happy medium, like with all things. But young guys, I, I'm finding, look, there's a, an element of people who don't want to come back to work. And I think there's going to be some longer term issues for Australia that no one's allowed to talk to, because if you don't go with the flow, everyone do you believe that? Yep, I do. Yeah. You're up, you're up yeah. in arms. Yep. Um, and I think there are so many areas for flexibility that they're important, and it's important that we, you offer flexibility. But you can't do that in all roles because some roles are customer-facing, so you need people. Some roles are operational where you need people to be there. So it, it's it's getting that, that balance right. But I'm finding more of the younger kids want to be mentored. So they don't want to be at home on their own, right? Because at first it sounded good, but then they want to be mentored. If I had had a management team of all new people when COVID hit, when we had to work at home, we would have failed. The thing that made our team work is that they'd worked together for years and we knew each other so well that when they were home, I didn't have to try to mentor them or didn't have to try to explain to them the culture, they knew it. So young, young kids need to be trained. And, and I'm seeing, I've got a lot of you know, praise for the younger generation. They want to learn. They want to grow. And they know they're not going to get that being at home on their own. You're getting a lot of young women into your industry? In the food business, yeah, definitely. And, and um, it's interesting. That's one area where I do see a lot of flexibility. I hope one day that, you know, we're able to have a whole lot of people, especially, you know, women who can't work full time, where we can offer, because with an iPad now, mm. it's got everything. So they, they can be in a country town and go and sell for us and don't need to be in the office. Um, so I think technology will help for, for me anyway, with, to have more people who can only work part time and women who, you know, may have other responsibilities but it's not just women it's men as well i mean it's the same issue coffee king who gave you that name i'm not 100 percent sure you didn't make it up in one of your yourself mm. or anything did you yeah no i'm you're pretty I, strong on marketing you see i'm egotistical <laughs> but uh, even i don't think i would have done that <laughs> don't know where it came from i think it was in one of the papers originally said it and you know, it became a bit of a joke i think more than anything now, is it true that your sales team has golden cars? Yep. I've been told by some of the young marketing people who come in that gold's an old colour and that we should change our colours. And I say to them, like, you know, why don't you go to McDonald's and tell them to get rid of the golden arches or tell Coca-Cola to get rid of, you know, 
their logo. And if, if they'll do it, I'll do it. Yeah, I mean, it, everyone wants to change everything. Where it's, it, it's when people start to recognize your gold or your, or your logo, you know you've made it. And that's not a time to change. Tradition, is it? Definitely. You know, we, we can't be the newest thing all the time, but we can be the, the traditionalist and you know, we, we can be the Rolex of coffee. As you've got more experience under your belt, when it comes to the next big key decisions you've got to make, is it analysis of the numbers or is it more gut instinct these days? Which way are you going? Oh, no, I think it's, I think it's a combination of, of both. I mean, things are moving so fast. I mean, you need to know the numbers. You need to know or have a gut feel. Mm. But you also have to try to work out where the elephant's running. You know, be like the pygmies. Smallest people in Africa, they couldn't, you know, how, how do they catch elephants? Because they work out where the elephant's going to go and build a trap and catch them. So for me, it's more about trying to work out where's the elephant going to go. And sometimes I think it's too late when you read about it and just following the next trend. But look, we've got, I'm lucky. I, I am lucky that my son's got a thousand ideas a day. Yeah. And I still like to throw things up much to, to their horror. Yep. We've got plenty of ideas, but it's blending that with the basics. You know, as I said to you, the world's a big place. Yep. And when I look at some of the biggest coffee companies in the world, yep. 60, 70 percent of their business is overseas. So they've opened up some good markets as well. There's some exciting things in the future for us. And is the price of coffee going up, Les, with, with COVID impacting the Brazilian hand pickers of coffee bean, et cetera? Actually, during COVID, coffee was probably cheapest ever. So it, it's a commodity. It's the second most traded commodity in the world after oil. So it goes up and down constantly. At the moment, it's definitely trending up. It's, you know, it's probably 50 or 60% increased in raw commodity price. And you know you, you can't put your price up and down every time it happens, so you tend to to ride that up. But I don't think you're going to see anything impacting in the in the coffee shop prices. I think when you look at it, the bigger impacts, you know, rent, labour, costs, um, and unfortunately, a lot of the cafes that you know that aren't going to make it through COVID. The, the suburban cafes kind of did pretty well in Sydney. Um, mm. Melbourne's been through hell. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. You know, and at the end of the day, I, I don't think it'll be the coffee prices. It'll be it'll be what's happened to their business overall. How important is giving to you, Les? You've um, you've obviously supported charity a lot during your your lifetime, but is there something in the DNA that we should think a lot more about? Yeah, I'm surprised at how little corporate Australia does sometimes. You know, I can tell you a story. I um when I even when I, we didn't have a lot of money, I used to donate the humidity cribs for you know, for babies that were, yeah. and as we got bigger, we were able to put more money in and I was able to help um, the Marta Hospital put in a, you know, one of many people who put money in and we were able to put in a new neonatal ward. Right, okay. And um, when you do things, you do them because you want to help. You don't do them because you think you're going to get anything back. And when my son's son was born and he was premier, you know, I went in and he was in a humidity crib and it was, had our name on it. And um, that was a, you know, a defining moment for me that, you know, when, when you do things and you do things because you want to do and help people, you get back things in spades. Got to ask you, Les, you're across the economy. What do you think of the leadership in Australia at the moment and where the Australian economy is going? I think the government gets a lot of you know, slack from the media on, on a whole range of things and, you know, some justified and some unjustified. But all in all, when I look at what's happening in Australia through COVID and where we are, and you compare it to what I've seen happen, especially in, in Europe, and, I, you know, and I'm in contact with them constantly, I think we've done an amazing job with, with COVID. And, and I think some of the things that they did, like JobKeeper and yeah. some of the other initiatives that were done, um, I, I think they've done a great job in, in some of those areas. Yeah, there are things that you know, people can complain about, but overall, I think we're incredibly lucky, and I think it's been managed well, and, and everyone deserves the credit because uh, it was also the people sticking to the what was being told and, and abiding by the rules and getting tested. And so I think Australia's got a lot to be very proud of in the way they handled 
COVID, both as a government and both as a population. I think economically, I think when we come out of COVID, I think it's going to be in a strong economy. I think we'll do pretty well out of it. If we were to sit here in five years' time, and let's just say COVID was solved around different parts of the world, what's Victoria going to look like? Well, I hope that if you get in a plane and you get off at an airport, you'll see a Victoria coffee store. And if you go around to different hotels, you, you'll see Victoria as a name. And, you know, that that expands. And pretty much, as you see it here, will be in the major, major cities around the world. And I'm going to be walking one to your one of your shops or one of your retail plays? Some will be ours. Some, some may just be franchised or some may be owned by other people. But it's more the, the experience and that you get a true full Italian experience from, as I said to you, coffee, gelato, drinks, um, you know, nice bread rolls, nice biscuits, nice cakes. Everyone wants to be Italian. <laughs> and um, I think we as Australians, we can beat them at their own game. Les, what is the secret then? Well, I'm sure everyone listening to this wants to know what's the secret of a good coffee, making a good coffee. You, you need fresh coffee. No matter what anyone tells you, coffee tastes best when it's fresh, right? And you've got to match the grind with the appliance. So that's the, the real trick. If it's a plunger, it's got to be a bit coarser than if it's, if it's an espresso machine. It's got to be finer. So you've got to make sure you've got the right grind and if you're grinding it yourself that's what you got to get right you need a clean machine and the right extraction time that 20 to 25 seconds get at the right espresso and espresso is the base of all coffees and then you add you know quantities of milk or whatever to, to, to suit have we come along the journey with you oh definitely now we're we, you know everyone's a coffee snob everyone thinks they know more about coffee than anyone else and i always love playing games with people and I've got a couple of coffee trees that I grew at Taramara and, you know, I've, got, I've had some real barista, um, I call them, no, I don't know what I call them, um, <laughs> but we get some of the barista hipsters and um, and I had great deal of pleasure in giving them one of my very exclusive blends for, for them to rave about, which was Taramara Gold in the end that we translated. So, yeah, we, we've come a long way, but, you know, sometimes... We overdo it a bit. A lot depends on who you're with, where you're with, and a great barista. And so coffee's certainly a lot better. You remember, in the, you'd go and you'd, you'd go to a little country town, there'd be four pubs. You know, now you're more likely to get four coffee shops in one pub. Yeah. So it's been a great journey, and you know, I feel very proud that I've you know, been a part of that journey. And But it's been fantastic to see the way Australians have embraced it and how good they are, and really... When it comes to milk-based coffees, I think we make Australia makes you know the best milk-based coffees in the world. Espressos, you still I think Italy knocks us off, but when it comes to milk-based coffees, we're right up there. So the French and the Yanks no good. French are terrible. <laughs> Yanks are even worse <laughs> with all the flavoured coffees and all the stuff. They're great marketers, but they, they've still got a long way to go in in in, in the coffee, you know. So, um, no, Australia's done incredibly well. Les, if you were to look back at that young man walking through, I guess, those doors at uh, Cantarella Brothers all those years ago, uh, the old man's still there? My father? Yeah. No, he's, my father's retired, yeah. He, he's 88, but you know, he's still around and he doesn't go into a you know, coffee shop on the coast without going in there and telling them that they should be changing coffees. And So if you were going to back all those days when he, when he brought you in, and you saw that not a bad looking woman over there in the corner you had your eye on, what advice would you give that younger man today? Look, I guess not to let people's negativity stop you from doing what you want. You know, honesty, you've got to be able to put your head on the pillow at night and know you've done the right thing. And uh, a lot of people may not agree with you, but you've got to know and, and, and be able to sleep at night knowing you have done the right thing and there's no doubt in my mind that having the right partner and the right support is critical you know and i could never have achieved what i have if it wasn't for the understanding and support of my my family so all in all yeah take the time to make sure you follow your dream and that les thanks very much for making the time to join us today no thank you very much greg thank you
You've been listening to No Limitations. 